Okay, so I know I was supposed to be toiling away on a museum video right now, but I got a little distracted. So there's one question that I've been pondering for a little while now, because historically, sloths have been depicted as being these big, often dumb, hairy beasts. But recently I've been seeing a lot of paleo artists and scientists alike starting to think about these animals in a completely different way. We already spoke about the recent discovery that shows that sloths may have been far more omnivorous and how many species may have supplemented their diet with scavenged meat. So I decided to make a poll on Instagram asking a question that may seem kind of obvious to some, and that is, could some sloths have possibly been hairless? And looking at the results, it's pretty clear that there's a very strong opinion that some of the unsightly monsters that you would see looking at a naked sloth just cannot possibly be a creation of the natural world. I can only guess that some of you might have seen the images of the three-toed sloth that apparently had fallen into water and died and in doing so lost all of its hair and when it was found by people, they couldn't even identify that it was a sloth. They actually had to do genetic analysis to confirm that this bizarre alien body was in fact something of this earth. It was actually going around online as like viral images of some strange cryptid creature. And I feel you, this is horrifying. Unfortunately, science doesn't really care about your feelings. And now that we have the results of this poll, I'm going to go through and talk about what my opinion is on the subject. The first thing that I want to clarify is that there's not just one species of giant ground sloth, or what we would call a giant ground sloth. There's actually more than 80 different genera within that group, and most of their evolutionary story takes place in South America and dates back to the late Eocene. At that time, the Earth was going through a lot of different changes, and it seems like sloth and other members of their clade were able to take advantage of this. Sloths are actually part of a clade called the Xenarthrans. This group includes sloths, anteaters, armadillos, and giant armored relatives of armadillos called Lyptodons. Now I'll get more into the evolutionary history of sloths in a future spotlight video, but I wanted to make note of the amount of diversity of sloth species because it'll be important for this video. They range in size from tiny tree sloths to the elephant-sized megatherium, and they adapted to many different lifestyles. And then when the land bridge formed between North and South America around 3 million years ago, Sloths were actually one of the only species to come from South America that actually did pretty well colonizing further north. Other species like Glyptodons did all right, but you don't see the amount of biodiversity in Glyptodons that you did in the ground sloths because once they got to North America, they spread and evolved into several other new species that had never been seen before. And for reference of how long sloths have had to diversify, around the same time that the first ground sloths were coming on the scene in South America, the ancestors of whales still had legs, horses still had toes and were about the size of cats, and Antarctica was still a green continent. So a lot can happen in that time. Because of this, I feel like there's a strong argument for both sides of this debate, depending on the species. And for one thing, we can go ahead and confirm right now that not all species of ground sloth were 100% hairless. Because one species, Mylodon, is one of the very few large animals not preserved in ice that we have mummified remains of. And as you can see, it was pretty furry. So at least we can say that the Americas weren't populated by what looks like giant alien fetuses. Or at least not entirely. Another example of a sloth that we know had hair was Nothrotheriops, the Shasta ground sloth. The proof was found in a cave around the Grand Canyon in the form of giant piles of poop. And these aren't coprolites. This isn't fossilized. It's actual poop. And aside from telling us that the Shasta ground sloth had a particular liking for the Joshua tree, it also contained hair, and lots of it. And if you're wondering how all this material has survived all this time without becoming fossilized or just breaking down, the cave has been kept at a consistently cooler, drier temperature, and basically, for all intents and purposes, refrigerated the massive piles of sloth fecal matter that line the edges of the cave. Basically, just like in the case of the Mylodon skin sample, 
causes it to mummify. So far we've talked about two different sloths that have definitive proof of having hair. So now it's time to talk about the opposite, an animal that I feel is probably, out of every species of sloth, was probably the most likely to have either extremely short, thick hair or possibly no hair at all. And that would be Thalassochnus, the marine sloth. Now we don't have any direct evidence to suggest whether or not this animal had hair, but if we look at modern analogs for comparison, I think it would just make the most sense. Particularly long shaggy hair would be a fairly sizable detriment to any animal that spends a great deal of time in the water. If you look at seals, sea lions, whales, all of these animals are mammals, but the hair on their bodies has been greatly reduced or is completely gone altogether. The other possibility is that it might have had hair like otters, which uses its extremely thick hair as an extra layer of insulation for maintaining its body temperature in the water, as well as buoyancy and actually helping to reduce drag in the water. And the last sloths that I want to talk about are the truly giant sloths. The animals like Megatherium and Ermotherium, the elephant-sized animals like the one that was depicted in episode 3 of La Brea. Many people have said to me that they feel like if any sloth would benefit from being hairless, or mostly hairless, that it would be these species because they tended to live in warmer climates. And on this, I'm kind of on the fence about it. On one hand, I definitely see the point. Normally, shaggier coats are normally associated with animals that need to stay warm, and obviously a large-bodied animal like this will need to dispense body heat more than retain it. For examples of this, look at modern animals like elephants, rhinos, and hippos. The ones around today live in warmer climates, and for the most part, they're not hairless, but they have very, very thin hair. So, there's been a lot of depictions of things like Uromotherium having almost elephant-like skin. Although I do find this plausible, the major difference between ground sloths and alzenarthrins and many other different placental mammals is that they have a, a particularly slow metabolic rate compared to most others. So their bodies naturally ran cooler than many of the large-bodied animals that we see today. And we see this today with the still living Xenarthrins like giant anteaters, armadillos, and tree sloths. So it's possible that they could have had thinner hair, but I'm definitely not as sure as I would be with an animal like a marine sloth. But one group of sloths that I feel most definitely would probably have had a shaggy coat, even though we don't have any direct evidence of it, would be a species like Megalonyx. The Jefferson ground sloth is one of the most far north reaching of the different sloths that came into North America. Because of this, during the Ice Age, they would have been exposed to colder temperatures, and for the most part, sloths stayed in the southern half of the United States. And Megalonyx is really the only one that we've seen have a lot of widespread distribution in the more northern reaches. And because of that slow metabolic rate and lower natural body temperature, it definitely would have needed a thick coat of fur. So really that's my analysis of it. I feel like there's a strong possibility that there could have been a mix of different hair lengths among ground sloths. And with around 50 million years of evolution and diversification, there's a very good chance that these sloths had plenty of opportunity to evolve into all sorts of weird and wonderful forms. And if you like imagining the endless possibilities that life can evolve into, I found a new channel that I highly recommend. It's called Keenan Taylor's Tales of Chimere, and it's made by Keenan Taylor. He's a published author that recently released a book by the same name. And all I can say is I am absolutely floored by the amount of thought and detail he's put into the world where his book as well as future books will take place. The first book is a series of 11 short stories and novellas that take place on a distant world called Chimere, a world that because of an interesting quirk in the biology of the native life on the planet, now has been populated by the descendants of species endemic to Earth from all different time periods. It's a little complicated, but he does a better job of explaining it than I ever could. And luckily he has decided to make a YouTube channel to help with that. Basically, his channel is a hub of all the speculative biology that has gone into creating Chimere. It's amazing. 
and all the artwork is hand drawn by him and I love it. If you want to go check it out, I recommend you start with the video titled What is Chimere and then follow me on down the rabbit hole. I cannot sing enough praise to this project. It is literally all the best parts of world building and evolutionary biology. I've been nerding out on it for a bit now. I'll leave a link to his channel as well as a link to the Amazon page where you can get a copy of his first book. You should definitely check it out. <laughs> I'm so much better at selling other people's stuff than I am my own. Ah, uh, well, if you enjoyed this and if you're not upset with me for reminding you about the weird naked alien baby that was discovered in South America a couple years ago, subscribe to Paleo Analysis as well. And don't forget to give this video a like. And, uh, yeah, I think it's time to take the kids to the museum. <sighs> okay. Have a good one, everybody.